Okay, so we've reached the, uh, the halfway mark, um, and our two final presentations come from radically different uh, areas and disciplines. Well, maybe not radically, but um, <laughs> and the first of these is by my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Sergio Drillo de la Torre. Uh, Sergio had the um, ambiguous privilege of starting his fellowship at the Museum of Natural History on the exact same day that I started my fellowship there as well. Um, <clears throat> so his presentation is Frontier Gospels and Christian Entanglements in the Trobrian Islands of Papua New Guinea. Dr. Drillo, uh, forgive me for shortening your surname. <laughs> Dr. Drillo was appointed as a postdoctoral fellow in anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History in 2014. His research focuses on cultural materializations in island Papua New Guinea. As such, Dr. Drillo has carried out extensive field work in the Trobrian Islands, the Milne Bay province, exploring the role of material and immaterial forms as mediators of cross-cultural encounters in the Pacific. In 2015, he extended this field work to a socio-ecological study of Buri Buri, a small archipelago of low-lying coral atolls off the Papua New Guinea coast, whose inhabitants are about to become environmental refugees due to the rising sea levels. The main scope of this project will be to understand and preserve key elements of local cosmologies I'm waiting for that voice prompt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> material and immaterial expressions and practical environment related knowledge that form part of the region's distinct socio-cultural heritage. Dr. Drillo is also research associate at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, where he is currently part of the Recovering Voices program, carrying out the analysis, consolidation and repatriation of a large corpus of indigenous oral folklore and its associated systems of knowledge to the Trobian Islands. Please join me in welcoming you to the stage. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for uh, um, letting me participate in this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, I've seen a number of talks here at Bard, and I have to say that I've always enjoyed them, so I feel I feel very privileged, uh, also a little bit nervous because the uh, standards are very high. Um, so I'll try, uh, I'll try my best to uh, keep it uh, short and sweet because I think we're all a bit tired after um, um, a very long day. Uh, I probably won't manage to keep it short enough, so I'll, I'll try to keep it sweet at least. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this paper is uh, uh, trying to analyze more closely the elements that are, um, constitute the uh, particular religious views of the tribe and islanders um, of Papua New Guinea and the processes by which locals integrate um, native custom into um, Christianity and Christian worldviews, and also uh, Christian worldviews into the Trobian, Trobian uh, customs. Um, first of all, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the area uh, where this, um, this uh, paper is uh, focused. Uh, this is called the, um, um, it's part of the uh, Milne Bay province in Papua New Guinea, so it's the easternmost um, part of Papua New Guinea. It's also known as the Mesim uh, or the Kula district. Now I see many uh, anthropologists in the audience, but uh, I just wanted to ask how many of you have heard about the Kula, the Kula trade or the Kula exchange? Oh, that's, that's quite a lot. Um, well, that's, that's going to make it easier. Uh, within the, um, Within the Messim, uh, I'll be focusing on the Trobian Islands of Papua New Guinea, which are famous mostly after um, um, Bronislav Malinowski's fieldwork from 1915 uh, to 1918. Um, well, the Kula district is uh, famous because of uh, the Kula Exchange. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know what the Kula Exchange is, um, it's a ceremonial exchange uh, that takes place around the Messim, where basically uh, people exchange shells. So they exchange uh, necklaces called sulava uh, clockwise, and uh, they exchange arm shells called mualis anti-clockwise. Um, it's uh, it's being compared to um, um, to a game. Uh, it's a uh, it's a ritual exchange that has been puzzling anthropologists um, to date, and still does. Um, but uh, it's sufficient to say that uh, it's uh, it's quite acknowledged and quite agreed among anthropologists that uh, um, the Kula the Kula exchange is all about building prestige or fame, um, as people people call it, in the museum. Um one of the uh, main instruments for uh, carrying out the uh, um, cool exchange, or you know, the only instrument, so to speak, the only tool to do so um, in the museum until fairly recently, 
uh, is these type of canoes that um, have different names depending on uh, what part of the museum uh, you're at. So um, this particular type uh, is called um, the Anaget canoe. Um, and within the, uh, uh, within the canoe, uh, perhaps the most important um, elements are these um, canoe boards that receive um, different names, again, depending on uh, which part of uh, um, the museum you are. So uh, this one on the left comes from Budi Budi, which is at the um, eastern more, um, easternmost part of the, um, of the cooler ring. That one on the right is a uh, Trabin Island um, Lagim. Uh, so they have different names, but essentially the same. Some, some anthropologists um, have compared these um, canoe boards to um, um, the equivalent, they say that they're the equivalent of a Gothic cathedral uh, in European, in, in European um, tradition. This is because they, uh, they consider um, these um, elements to encompass the cosmologies of uh, the Messim uh, to such a degree that um, it's perhaps the most important item of material culture in, in the area. Um, to become a cover of, a, uh, of a, a canoe boards, one has to be initiated uh, at a very early age, um, around four or five um, years of age. And one is always an apprentice, um, despite many, many years of uh, carving uh, and you know, despite some being uh, extremely talented, as you can see, uh, with these uh, very refined examples of, uh, of uh, Lagim and Kunubwara. Uh, one is always learning, uh, and this is because one has to um, dream the uh, elements or symbols that are present uh, in the in the lagim. Um, I'm going to focus on. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to focus on uh, one particular element uh, in the uh, canoe board. Uh, it's called the bolai. So, it's these two fellows here or this one fella here. Uh, Messim art or Messim material culture is um, highly abstract. There's, um, there are hardly any uh, um, uh, anthropomorphic representations in, in Messim art, except for perhaps you know, these, um, these guys here. Um, the Bolai are um, spirits. Um, they take different shapes, different forms. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's agreed that they are spirits. They, um, um, they are androgynous in the sense that um, there's not a sex uh, gender ascribed to, um, to them. As you can see, they don't have, sometimes they have no physical features whatsoever. Uh, sometimes they have both uh, female and male um, organs. Uh, and the purpose of the Boala is actually um, to, um, to help the uh, uh, canoe uh, crews in, uh, uh, in case of a shipwreck. So as you can see from this panel, what happens when, uh, um, when the, um, the canoe, if the canoe uh, capsizes or there's a shipwreck, the bolai come to life and they would summon this, um, um, this big fish or whale called uh, um, the bosu. Uh, the bosu would come and just take the um, crew of the uh, canoe uh, back to safety to, um, to an island. Uh, this is, of course, if and only if the uh, Toliwaga or the, um, the head of the expedition or the cool expedition has been careful enough to uh, bespell the Bolai. Uh, so he needs to utter a spell to the Bolai so that you know, they would um, they'd assume this uh, protective um, capacity. Uh, the Bolai are not always uh, that good, uh, as you can probably see from these, um, from these uh, um, fairly old uh, canoe board that actually comes from a different uh, part of, uh, of the machine. Uh, it comes from the uh, um, Dantro Casto Islands. Um, and uh, you can see they, you know, th these guys, they don't look that friendly anymore. Uh, in fact, um, this is another uh, uh, representation of the Bolai. Uh, in, uh, in the Messim carving tradition, when you see uh, elements, anthropomorphic elements that have these uh, type of round eyes uh, with some sort of a um, decoration underneath, they almost always identify to um, sorcery. Uh, it can either be flying witches or uh, sorcerers uh, that are known as Boagao um, in the Messim. So basically what happens is that if the um, uh, Toliwaga, the um, the chief expedition in the canoe has forgotten to bespell the Bolai. Instead of, uh, in case of a shipwreck, instead of, um, instead of uh, helping the crew, they would actually uh, do the opposite. They would either call um, sharks or other um, biting fish, as they're called in, uh, in the area, or directly they would, um, they would swallow the, um, they would eat up the, um, the crew. Um, 
this is a this is a representation of a Boilai gone evil, so to speak. It's rather two representations. On the left, you have a um, one of these uh, cooler valuables. Um, it's an arm shell called Segu Segu. Um, it's uh, as you may or may not know, the cooler valuables in the museum are ranked. So some of them have a higher rank than others. Segu Segu is one of the highest rank um, ranked uh, cooler valuables. And a few years ago, its, uh, it's owner, um, this man called Tom Davy, who's also a very good carver, made this carving uh, for it. And uh, the photo is really bad, unfortunately, but you can see something that's quite similar, and it's inspired on this, on this one here. Uh, and it's basically, again, a representation of a, um, of a Boilai um, gone, gone evil. Um, but uh, let's go back to transcultural encounters. Um, or inter intercultural encounters um, in the museum. These exchanges have been taking place in the area for a long time. Uh, they're not always written records of this type of exchanges. Uh, it is very likely that uh, they started um, happening more regularly with um, whalers uh, around 1820s. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an illustration of one of the um, first recorded um, um, such encounters. It was the... Um, um, it was a voyage of the um, ra uh, rattlesnake in 1850s. Uh, it didn't go uh, around the machine, the whole area, but uh, it just touched upon some, some parts of it uh, in the south. And uh, what I like about this, uh, this illustration is the fact that uh, it, I think it, it does a very good job of showing what, um, even at such an early um, stage, uh, what the locals expected from these encounters. As you can see, they, um, they, they seem very eager to, um, to trade and to exchange uh, objects with, um, with, uh, um, with the rattlesnake, with the crew of the um, rattlesnake, including uh, what looks like perhaps a real cutlass. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, um, there's a couple of them uh, in the exhibition. Um, so what I'm interested um, in is that the fact that uh, you know, these exchanges um, um, took place for such a long time before there was a, a steady presence of Europeans in the, uh, in the area. Uh, I, I think that we cannot, we cannot see these exchanges as simple transactions in, in artifacts and in, uh, in commodities. Um, of course, they also involve concepts in, and schemas that are um, invariably attached to the, to the things that were exchanged. And at the same time, they transformed these, um, these very objects that circulated together with, um, with the people. Uh, with the people. Um, so even though it seems quite an obvious point to make, it still needs to, uh, to be made that uh, cultural encounters involve reciprocal efforts of uh, translation and adaptation uh, and understanding to prepare a common ground um, of interaction where difference and similarity can, can meet. Uh, scholars have been sort of trying to pin down uh, the main characteristics of these encounters, and uh, they seem to oscillate between, uh, between Western hegemony, or uh, what's been termed as acculturation sometimes, and uh, it's sort of like diametrical um, opposite, local resilience, or the maintenance of tradition. Uh, but I think it's hardly a matter of, uh, it's hardly ever a matter of exclusives. Um, you know, there's never, there's never quite total um, cultural subjugation or impenetrable resistance. I think in between there's, a, there's always a middle ground that uh, always results from a um, dialectic of, of exchanges. And uh, this, is, this is a little bit what, these, um, um, what Sean's exhibition uh, is about, and does such a good job of uh, explaining um, this dialectic of, ex of, of exchanges. Uh, that they receive many names. I mean, people will, Sean is um, chosen for reasons he's explained to us um, quite well um, during the walk in the gallery um, to term it as um, entanglement. But you also uh, find uh, terms like hybridization or creolization, depending on what part of the, um, of the world you're at. Um, I, like an, um, I like the way uh, uh, Chantal Knowles and uh, Gosden uh, talk about it, and Chris Gosden talk about it. They, um, they use a metaphor um, borrowed from chemistry where they differentiate between uh, a mix and a reaction, where basically um, you have in a mix chemical elements that are uh, notwithstanding the fact that they're mixing, they maintain their uh, chemical properties. And a um, reaction is basically when those elements uh, lose their chemical properties to uh, conform something else. Uh, 
So, in the Trobian Islands, the, um, the capacity of the Trobian Islanders to um, adopt and adapt um, alien social cultural em elements encompasses material forms, but also more uh, um, abstract ideas that range from uh, local objects that uh, imitate foreign ones. Um, sorry, I didn't say anything about this fantastic um, object. This is a working, a working torch. Um, it's entirely carved in wood. It was made in the 1970s by David Moluasi. And it was, uh, it was just an imitation of a real torch. Uh, it was fitted uh, with, with a light bulb and the batteries, and it was a working, it was a working torch, which I think is quite, it's quite genius. But uh, anyway, uh, this is just uh, to, um, to stress that the tribunal's capacity to, um, to adopt and adapt foreign um, elements and, and ideas and make them native. Perhaps the most famous uh, one of these, um, these adaptations is uh, Trabian Cricket. Um, Trabian Cricket was uh, brought to um, the Trabian Islands and the whole area by um, um, Methodist missionaries. And it was uh, soon turned into a, um, an affirmation of Trabian creativity. Um, of course, it was brought, to, um, it was brought as, a, um, as a uniforming game, so to speak. It, you know, it's part of the, uh, um, um, the British colonial endeavors to um, you know, sort of homogenize um, the empire and just have everybody play, you know, the same game. Very difficult game, by the way. I don't know if you've ever watched a game of cricket. It seems uh, impossible to understand. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. I mean, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's a fantastic game once you can understand it. But, um, but this, this actually poses a problem. Um, uh, idioms like creativity, for instance, or creolization, um, a very um, do a, do a very good job of, of explaining you know um, instances like Trabian cricket, but I think unless unpacked, they tend to um, hide the um, hierarchies that um, inform the flow of exchanges. And uh, I think in this case, or more in, in you know in the whole um, for the whole Pacific, it's important to um, to highlight the fact that the local populations did not choose to be colonized. Um, so creative hybridization was not always as much a free choice as a survival strategy. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, um, Trobian Cricket can also be uh, labeled as ingenious resistance. In fact, um, I think you'd be screening it here um, together with um, Dave, um, Jerry Leach, sorry, which was the director um, who shot the, um, the famous Trobian Cricket, uh, which is uh, um, it's called Trobian Cricket and ingenious response to um, colonialism. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, uh, it is, I think it's important to stress the fact that uh, um, the Trabinders, the Trabian Islanders and the people in the museum at large um, have always, um, have always, have, al have always uh, um, uh, uh, welcome uh, external influence. And I think this is probably to be found uh, in the, um, um, uh, in the ethos, in the cultural ethos of the, of the region, of the, um, of the area, where basically um, exchange and uh, rel relationality uh, is, one of the, is one of the pillars of, um, <coughs> of Masim societies. And uh, um, of course, the Kula uh, is, a good example, is a good example of that. But uh, uh, in, in this particular case, and in other um, instances, as we should see now, um, the local becomes as foreign as the, as the foreign becomes local. So they're both equal, equally familiar um, and Trabian. Um, scholars in the, uh, in the area, or at least in Melanesia, have tried to, um, have tried to um, theorize about uh, the, you know, uh, what are the characteristics of um, these uh, cultural exchanges and uh, you know, what what made local populations adopt foreign elements. Um, when I say foreign elements, I mean things, um, symbols, uh, ideas, schemas, and also um, all the way to fully structured um, religious beliefs and, and systems. Uh, but I think it's important to, um, again, to stress the fact that there's, not, there's no um, simple replacement. It's not that you take these things or these ideas or these symbols and you replace the foreign um, um, with the locals. Um, one, uh, one such attempt at uh, um, theorizing um, 
this uh, adoption of the foreign element was uh, uh, Salin's, Marsha Salin's uh, famous notion of a uh, humiliation um, that was um, expanded by a, um, in an edited volume by uh, Joel Robbins and Holly Wardlow, uh, I think in 2000, 2000 no, 2005. Um, basically what uh, um, Salin's proposed and uh, what some, some scholars um, um, picked on was that uh, once confronted with um, foreign um, culture, with Western culture, uh, local populations and Melanesians in this particular case uh, registered inferiority of their own um, culture and they subsequently rushed to embrace um, Euro-American models, eventually dropping their own traditions. And uh, Christianity is taken as one of, um, one of the stereotypical um, examples uh, for this. Now, without wanting to um, debate um, much of this, uh, because I believe that uh, Melanesia is a very um, uh, varied region, um, so is Papua New Guinea, uh, led along the whole of the Pacific and Oceania. Uh, I'm going to make uh, a case for the opposite. I'm going to say that uh, um, basically the, the contrary happened in the Trojan Islands, and this is, this is going to be the, um, the main point of my argument. Um, basically, um, in the Trojan Islands, I believe that Christianity is not the basis for um, uniforming acculturation. Uh, it, it's instead uh, more like an opportunity to deploy um, the creativity of Trebian Islands to guarantee the cultural um, survival of vernacular ideas and expand those local views beyond the Trebian the Islands. So it's, it's an opportunity to um, expand Trebianness, if you wish, um, beyond the, um, the Trebians. So I'm going to give you a series of examples of uh, um, how this forced creativity uh, turns into um, forceful materializations. Now, I use the term materializations after um, um, a paper that um, Joshua Bell and um, um, Heidi Geismer published in 2009. And I think it's uh, materialization renders, um, gives better the idea of, um, of what it means to make an object. So it doesn't talk about the material only, but it talks about um, in, in in Bell and Geismer's own words, the interweaving of words, materials, and human action. And we've seen throughout um, the previous presentations how that's the case. This is not just, we don't talk just about an object, but we talk about like all the things that surround the object that involve human action, um, words, songs, and other sorts of um, um, practices. So I'm going to talk in particular about um, um, two, um, two practices in the Trobin Islands. Uh, one is the uh, identification of uh, Christianity uh, and the role of uh, pastors with the uh, uh, garden magician, or Towosi. And the other one is uh, another practice uh, called Katupela Guguya, which basically means the exchange of sermons that was modeled upon um, the Kula, the Kula exchange. So let me talk a little bit about uh, Christianity uh, in the Messine, with this rather violent uh, image, the martyrdom of uh, Giovanni Mazzucconi. Um, Christianity arrived quite early in the Messine uh, compared to other regions of uh, Papua New Guinea. There was, a, um, there was an ill-fated um, uh, Catholic mission uh, in uh, Woodlock Island um, that uh, was started by, um, um, I believe it was uh, uh, um, Pimates, an Italian, an Italian missionary group in 1847. Uh, it ended in 1855 with uh, the martyrdom, the, the killing of um, all the missionaries. Um, as you probably know, the, um, uh, New Guinea was annexed to the British Empire in 1888, um, or at least what you know, was part of uh, um, uh, British New Guinea. Um, and uh, soon enough, the uh, British government um, did a distribution of areas to different different missions. So the um, the Messine or the uh, Minabe province was given, so to speak, to the um, to the Australasian um, Wesleyan Methodist uh, Missionary Society, and they started um, operating quite early on. In 1891, um, Reverend George Brown, who had been previously in uh, other parts of the Pacific, like Fiji and New Britain, uh, established um, the first uh, mission in in the Messine. Uh, and it was established in Dobu. Uh, this is not um, a coincidence. Dobu was, uh, was known at the time as one of the uh, fiercest and most dangerous places uh, in the area. So these, um, 
this um, Australian guy called Wi uh, William Bramilov um, settled down in Dobu in 1894, and um, sorry, in 1891. And in 1894, um, another branch opened in the Chobin Islands uh, with the uh, Reverend Samuel Fellows. In 1935, the first Catholic mission opened uh, in uh, the Chobin Islands in a place called Gusaweta. And ever since then, there's been, uh, there's been other Christian denominations um, coming, including Seventh-day um, Adventists um, and other lately mostly um, Evangelicals and Pentecostals. And just pretty much like colonial officers, whalers, uh, traders, and other visitors, the, the missionaries were giving uh, a warm welcome uh, by the locals, despite, um, despite <laughs> what happened in Woodlock um, quite early on. Um, and uh, they, uh, they started working quite early on, uh, the missionaries started working quite early on on uh, how, to, um, how to convey their message um, and how to convey their message to, um, to um, a group of people who knew nothing about um, Christianity. So of course, one of the, um, one of the main tools to um, get this message across uh, was a mimesis. Um, they tried to look for uh, um, elements that looked uh, very similar to uh, the elements of uh, Christianity within uh, native and local cosmologies. Uh, perhaps like the most, um, the most common way of doing this was uh, um, uh, identifying a godlike figure in, in a local pantheon. In the Messim, there are several um, related um, myths, foundation myths that uh, um, have such figure. Uh, it's a cultural hero that uh, assumes different names and depending on which island we're at. So his uh, alternative called Tudava or Dovana or Gereu. Uh, he's, uh, he's some sort of a um, demiurge or um, a primordial creator that uh, generates islands and shapes landmarks. Um, he gives crops, crops to the people and foodstuffs and uh, establishes um, um, social customs and most importantly, um, exchange networks. Uh, one, of the, one of the missionaries uh, who was in uh, Woodlark um, early on in 1847, um, there's a French um, um, man called Father uh, Montrousier, uh, tried to make this, tried to make this, uh, this connection in, uh, in the Messim with, uh, um, with one of these uh, cultural heroes, um, Gerehu. Um, other concepts within Christianity were more difficult to incorporate, and in particular, um, the concept of the, of the Trinity. Um, even at the time, other uh, Catholic missionaries and uh, the following Wesleyan Methodist missionaries saw that as a, a too complicated a tenet to be, um, to be explained to, um, um, to, the, to the locals. So this is the idea that explaining, um, um, comparing cosmologies cross-culturally is not always appropriate. Uh, it can backfire. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that uh, um, Malinowski um, famously wrote, wrote about um, when he said that, you know, this is, this is going to um, backfire in this, in this part of, um, of Melanesia. It's never going to work. But uh, quite interestingly, um, he was not referring to this particular uh, legume, but uh, this is the only example I know that uh, has uh, three boilae as you can see. So whether this is associated to the Trinity or not, um, it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to know it. But uh, uh, let's move on a little bit into um, um, Trobian materializations. Uh, what you can see is uh, Lixa, or uh, uh, chiefly Trobian uh, resting house. Um, these are just open houses that are built in uh, villages for um, um, people to um, sit down and talk uh, and rest. As you can see, it's very, uh, um, very well decorated with uh, what are um, traditional Trobian emblems um, that are associated to chiefs. So these emblems are called koni in the Trobian Islands. And uh, um, among the many metric clans of the Trobian Islands, there are only uh, four that are chiefly enough to, um, um, to have the privilege to display these, these symbols and emblems. Uh, very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, but uh, this little fella you can see here repeated several times is called Udawara. Uh, I don't know if you can make any wild guesses as to what it represents. Um, I'll tell you straight away, it's a kingfisher. Uh, 
It's a kingfisher and it's put in the, uh, uh, it's put in the lixa because um, people say that the kingfisher um, sort of mirrors the behavior of the chiefs. So the kingfisher stands in a branch and doesn't move around a lot. You know, it does like, unlike other birds, doesn't go fossicking, looking for worms or bugs or things to eat. It just sits there until he sees the moment clearing off and just, you know, goes down and gets what he needs and goes back to his branch. And this is what the um, behavior of a good, good chief is supposed to be in the Trobian Islands. Just wait until the opportunity is ripe to um, get the things you need. Um, but um, as you can see, the, um, the Lixa uh, has been reproduced quite well uh, within uh, um, Christian uh, iconology and iconography. Um, and not only the Lixa, but uh, um, this, which essentially has the same elements as, as the Lixa, is a famous Trobian uh, yam house or Liku. Uh, so this one in Tukwakwa belongs to one of the um, highest ranked chiefs. It was um, constructed recently when I was there in 2010. And I just want you to um, see the very obvious um, um, appropriation of you know, this, um, this element. Um, that signifies um, the chiefly lineages and how it's reproduced in uh, this is the interior of the Catholic Church of Iluta, which is a village in the Trobian Islands. So you have essentially the same iconography except for uh, on top you have a, um, a Christian, Christian cross. Now this, uh, this, type, of, uh, this type of appropriation is, uh, is reproduced um, also in, uh, in uh, in discourses. So, for instance, in the Bible, in uh, the Trobian Islands, God is referred to as Guyao. Guyao is a local name for chief, so God is called the chief. Interestingly enough, in other parts of the um, Messim, God has been translated as Gereo Dovana, which is this demiurge um, 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 cultural hero, this, uh, this founder. So, depending on which part of the Messim you are, there's an identification with, with different, um, different local um, figures. But uh, these analogies go, um, um, go beyond that. Uh, and I'm going to um, talk very briefly about um, um, Trobian cosmologies. Um, this, is, um, this is Tuma. Tuma is a small island to the north of, um, of the Trobian Islands, of Kiriwina. It's part of the Trobian Islands. And uh, Tuma is believed to be the, uh, the underworld. Um, so people in, in the Trobian Islands and pretty much throughout the um, northern part of the Messim at least believe that when somebody dies, their soul travels to Tuma and they enter, they enter the underworld um, exactly where this man is sitting. Uh, that's a, um, it's a famous rock called Gilela and uh, the souls of the deceased travel to uh, Gilela and um, of course they're crying because they're leaving all their um, friends and relatives behind. But once they wash their faces with the water of Gilela, they forget completely about um, their um, um, terrestrial lives, so to speak, and they go inside Tuma. And uh, Tuma is, uh, um, Malinowski talks at length about Tuma in a, a famous article uh, called Baloma. Baloma is a, um, the name given by the locals to the souls of the, of the dead. Um, and Tuma is, is identified as a, as a paradise. When, when you die, you go to Tuma, and uh, all you do in Tuma is um, eat pork and feast constantly, and you don't have to work. Uh, you can go fishing if you want to. If not, you, you can just sit down and have sexual intercourse with whoever you want because there's no morals in Tuma. And, uh, and you have a um, very good life. Uh, and the, <laughs> the, the parallels between Tuma and the, um, the Christian paradise or heaven um, are quite, quite obvious and quite striking, so much so that um, some, some Trobinders have, um, well, not some, but most Trobinders um, actively identify both. Um, as, as being one and the same Tuma and, and Heaven. Most notably, there was a, um, this Trobian uh, um, Islander called Keto who wrote, wrote a thesis in, uh, on theology uh, who basically um, um, identifies all the elements that are um, um, sort of like establish a parallel between Tuma and, and Heaven. <clears throat> Uh, this, I want to talk a little bit more about these, uh, this sort of like um, identification between, between elements 
uh, within local cosmologies and, and Christianity uh, and how these are um, sort of um, theorized. Um, from the Travian perspective, what happens is that, uh, um, and not just for Christianity, but also for other um, uh, foreign elements, what happens is that uh, uh, novelty has always roots in the past. Um, basically, they believe that the, the, the future was already embedded in actions that pertain to um, a pretary temporality, so to speak. And I'm, I'm going to try and explain this um, a little bit more using two, um, two metaphors. Uh, one is the, uh, the passage of uh, darkness um, to light. Uh, so I'm going to simplify perhaps a little bit too much, but uh, um, in a nutshell what happens is that Christian religion um, is linked to modernity and things that are modern in the Trojan Islands uh, are considered to be positive. And this is in contraposition to the old, which is considered to be um, negative. Uh, the new uh, has connotations that are um, sort of associated to, uh, to light. Um, light in Kilivila is, uh, is um, uh, called Luma Lama, which uh, uh, literally means the moonlight. Uh, but um, it also means something bright that can pierce the darkness. And this is this is a metaphor for knowledge um, that is employed quite commonly even, was employed even before um, you know, the arrival of, um, of uh, missionaries to say that the light pierces um, um, darkness and you know, it, it makes us knowledgeable. Uh, in opposition to the light of the modern, so to speak, uh, there's the old stuff. The old stuff is dark. Um, um, the word in, in the local language is dudubila. Um, and when people talk about um, the past nowadays, they say that uh, their ancestors, people in the dark, in, in, in the past lived in, in uh, the darkness, because they didn't know, um, so they don't have the knowledge. Um, now, ascribing these, uh, this positive value to the light and negative value to, um, to the darkness is, is, um, is a very important metaphor of, uh, of uh, representation that is sustaining this uh, sort of like visual paradigm. Um, that modernity, you know, is positive because it allowed people to um, to see through um, to see through the dark or, or, or to pierce to pierce the dark. Now there are many many examples throughout the museum in many islands of the museum of, of this. Uh, Nancy Nancy Mann, who uh, uh, worked in Gawa Island, which is another island to the um, east of the Trobian Islands, between the Trobian Islands and Woodlock Island, um, talking about the um, um, initiation of the um, of the carvers, and I quote said. Um, Skillful carvers are said to have been uh, to have been dispelled in childhood to purify their minds so that designs can emerge outside clearly delineated in the light. Uh, she says that darkness is unproductive and it's often associated in Gawa to uh, other negative things like heaviness, death, and flying witches. The opposite instead is a person uh, or a thing. Um, that is capable of um, emitting a type of uh, radiance or uh, um, brilliance that is uh, known in Kilivila as Moasila. Moasila is also the name of a magic of attraction that is used in the Kula, but is used for other things as well, that basically um, um, does this, this amazing trick of like making you shed all your negative, um, um, uh, how do I say that? Ne negative um, signs and uh, makes you younger and more beautiful and more rightful and and more likely to achieve your own, to achieve your own purposes. Uh, and uh, yeah, and some people say that uh, uh, Mozilla is uh, uh, is a type of unusual uh, beauty that is associated to um, to lightning. Uh, lightning, sorry. Uh, the image of lightning is is quite appropriate as well because in in the context of the Kula. Uh, one's uh, fame uh, is called, to, to talk about one's fame is called butu, uh, which is the thundering roll that the, um, the thunder makes. So there's, there's this association between fame, uh, light, and uh, um, the sound of the, um, of the, um, of the thunder. Um, there's some other examples of this association of, of light and, uh, and positive things. So, for instance, uh, Fred Damon reports that in uh, Woodlock Island in Muyu, uh, the old year is perceived as a time of darkness compared to the new year that is coming with, uh, um, with, the, new, um, with the new harvest. Uh, inter interestingly enough, uh, Fred Damon um, reports that he's, he's not entirely sure that this was, this was a concept that um, existed before the arrival of missionaries. Uh, so at least for Woodlock Island, we don't know whether this was, you know, this concept of light and darkness was influenced by by the missionaries or it was already um, already existing. 
sorry, I need a drink. So the other concept I want to talk about um, is um, that, it, and it's quite associated actually to um, to light and darkness, is uh, the um, the conceptual the tribal conceptualization of, of time. Um, and Ed Weiner talks a little bit about this, and so does um, Nancy Mann. But basically, again, simplifying uh, um, quite a lot, the um, Trojan Islanders and other people in the Messine conceive time as a as a spiral. So this passage from from uh, darkness to light um, may have been brought by the intercession intercession of the um, the missionaries who um, who brought God's knowledge um, to the area. But Trojan Islanders and other people in the Messine would claim that. This knowledge was already existed already in the past in a in a um, different form. So basically, and this is something that is visually represented. You know, that's that's why some people say that you know this is as important to um, um, to Messine people as a Gothic cathedral was to um, cathedral was to um, um, Europeans. Uh, it's represented by you know these spirals and many other um, scrolls and patterns that you see throughout um, Messine materializations. So basically, the past is a, um, a recurrent and uh, malleable embryo or seed for a, um, a latent future, for latent future um, possibilities. Um, this is again uh, epitomized uh, visually by um, the, um, the uh, Nautilus shell, uh, Nautilus pompilius, um, the chamber Nautilus. Uh, as you can see, the Nautilus, as you probably know, the Nautilus grows in a, in a pattern uh, that follows a logarithmic um, spiral, uh, and it expands from its own preceding chambers um, following the principle of the golden section. So basically what, what happens is that in, it incorporates um, the magnitude of the previous, um, um, the previous loop uh, or performance, if you want, or action or image uh, into the body of the shell. So you can anticipate what's going to happen looking at what happened um, in the past. So there's a series of uh, latent possibilities that are um, encompassed within the spiral symbol. And this, of course, informs strobing conceptions of, uh, of Christian knowledge. So the future uh, may be unknown, but it's actually subsumed into the past and transformed into a, a known possibility that was already there. Um, so the time of the ancestors, the time already finished, um, uh, becomes a time or a temporality rather that are, um, is ready to be developed again in the future when needed. That seems a bit confusing, but uh, I'm going to try and explain uh, some of it through uh, another uh, um, practice that made the Trabunders, um famous, at least in anthropology, which is um, gardening, uh, yam gardening. Um, Trovinders are subsistence horticulturalists, and they grow yams, like many other people in uh, Papua New Guinea and the rest of um, um, the rest of Melanesia. Uh, yams are not just a staple; um, they also um, they have a highly symbolic value. You cannot do anything in the Trovin Islands or in the rest of the Messine without yams. So, for instance, the canoe that um, I showed you before that um, um, was built for a chief was paid for with with yams, or uh, uh, marriages are paid for uh, with yams. Uh, there's a series of tributes in the Trojan Islands that people bring to the chiefs to um, be put on those um, um, yam houses um, that basically signify the importance of, um, of, the, um, of the yam as a crop in, in the Messine. And to achieve, um, to achieve good harvest, um, any Trojan that uses magic. Um, there's a body of uh, um, magic that uh, Malinowski, of course, uh, as usual, talked about uh, that is called Megwa. Again, I, I don't have time to uh, go into the details and to the particulars of Megwa, but uh, basically uh, it's, a, it's a system of knowledge, so to speak, that uh, um, uh, involves different stages. And the, one of these stages is called uh, um, Bilubaloma. The Bilubaloma is actually the invocation of the spirits of the ancestors. So basically what happens is that uh, the practitioner uh, starts um, naming the genealogies of uh, his deceased ancestors. Um, starting with the first one and moving all the way um, until his most immediate um, relative. And once he's achieved that, basically what he's, um, once he's done that, what, 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 what he thinks he's achieving is um, he's bringing back from the um, world of uh, Tuma his ancestors who are going to sit at the back of him and uh, uh, help him with his um, gardening. Um, 
so again, this is, I mean, this is, this is not new. Like um, 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 Sean uh, rightly said before that, um, you know, this type of um, entanglement and type um, um, interpretations using uh, um, symbols that are um, more familiar, um, we're more familiar with is, is being taking place um, forever, so to speak. Uh, this is a uh, this is an image from the um, catacombs of Priscilla in, in uh, Rome, and it um, depicts this um, um, this vision of uh, of God as a good shepherd. Um, of course, um, there's no herds to be shepherded in the Trojan Islands, so as you can probably anticipate, um, this this takes another um, another shape in the Trojan Islands, and it is the um, it's a garden magician of Towosi. Towosi literally means the man who sings, uh, the man who sings. Uh, is a is a key figure in in uh, Trojan society. He's a uh, he's uh, the garden magician. He's a person who actually uh, is in direct um, contact with uh, um, with the spirits of the ancestors, and uh, he's basically the uh, person responsible for uh, um, for bringing good um, good crops. Uh, there hasn't been a Towosi in the Trojan Islands for at least forty years, probably um, probably more. Um, one of the one of the last ones was um, Seboagao. But uh, basically, I, I, I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but just so you know that the, um, the, the Tawosi has been replaced by um, Christian, Christian pastors uh, and reverends who take up this role. Um, and what they do is they, they theorize that um, um, the first ancestor to everybody was God. So when you're calling actually upon your ancestors to come, to come from Tuma and help you, you're actually also um, calling upon God to be you know, the ultimate ancestor who's going to, um, to help you with, um, with that. Uh, the other instance of, a, of, um, of a, um, appropriation of Christianity is um, uh, what I mentioned before, the Katupela Guguya, the, uh, the exchange of sermons. So basically what happened is that when the, um, um, the missionaries moved in, they tried to ban some of the uh, local practices, including um, the kula, because um, something that involves people going around and invoking flying witches and using magic is not a very Christian thing to do. Uh, this was until the 1980s when uh, these, uh, um, these uh, reverend uh, from the Trobin Islands came up with this uh, brilliant idea of uh, doing a kula of the sermons. So basically what happens is that um, entire hamlets or villages go to a different community and instead of exchanging shells, they exchange the, um, the word of God. So this is actually modeled um, upon the, um, the kula. Uh, so much so that uh, you actually have uh, real kula exchanges going on at the same time as these uh, exchanges of sermons. And this is this is um, um, one of them. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so uh, I um, I just wanted to uh, uh, talk briefly uh, about the reverse. I mean, this is you know I've been I've been, I've been talking about um, Christianity being incorporated uh, within um, the Trobian Trobian cosmologies, but. Uh, but some of the reverse is also the case, uh, at least when it comes to some materializations. So what you see here are some, um, some uh, figures carved by um, um, Trabinders for uh, um, a nativity scene. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's not very obvious from this um, slide here, but you can see the adoration of the Maggie here with a plastic baby Jesus as, I don't know, black salvage from somewhere, but the rest are local, um, local carvings. And, and these, of course, are the, uh, the kind of tributes that uh, um, locals would bring to, um, to achieve. Uh, so much so that actually many, um, um, uh, many carvers are actually making a living by exporting these carvings to, um, um, to European churches. Uh, so you might, you might say, I know for a fact that the previous um, Catholic bishop of, uh, of a diocese in the area um, um, got at least 100 carvings to be taken back to um, churches in, in Italy. And I want to go back to, um, to, the, uh, to the legim and to the, to the bolai. Um, this is a legim that was carved in 2009 by uh, Paul Guillaume Kumunku, uh, Kalubaku. And uh, as you can see, instead of uh, the bolai, there's a, there's a crucifix. So it's a, it's a beautiful object to begin with, but it's also quite interesting because it has replaced uh, um, a spirit with a um, you know, with, a, with the image of God. 
So uh, when I asked uh, Paul about this, why, why did he choose to, um, to put this um, crucifix here, uh, his explanation was, um, was, I mean, it, it was quite logical in the sense that he said, well, you know, like in the past we uh, relied on the um, on the magic and relied on the on the Bolai to protect us in these journeys. Uh, nowadays we have God. Um, but not only that, I mean, he also, uh, he also explained to me how the word of God sort of spread in the Messim throughout the missionaries. And as you may recall, um, as I said before, um, the first settlement um, was in Dobu. And it's quite likely that even before there was a, a mission and missionaries ever came to the Trubin Islands, um, Trubin Islanders may have heard about Christianity through, um, um, through the Kula partners, people coming to, uh, um, to um, the Trubin Islands to um, exchange shells as part of the Kula. So in Paul's reasoning, it's only normal that you, know, you would have a, um, you'd have a crucifix um, you know, for protection purposes and, and also as, as, a, as an explanation of uh, how Christianity sort of uh, went around the Messim. Uh, I think I've run out of time, is that? <laughs> okay. So thank you. <laughs>